This program originates live with the NBC Television Network. presents the 1965 World Series. From Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota, the Los Angeles Dodgers meeting the Minnesota Twins. Brought to you by... Body, this is Ben Scully, along with Ray Scott, welcoming you to Metropolitan Stadium and the first game of this 1965 World Series. To thank you for using their products, Gillette and Chrysler also present for your pleasure the All-Star Baseball Game, NCAA Football, and the 1966 Rose Bowl Game over most of these same NBC stations. Metropolitan Stadium is the scene for the first game of the 1965 World Series. As far as the weather is concerned, a tremendous break. Sunshine and a temperature reported to go as high as 75 degrees. A capacity crowd will be looking on. The crowd here is 45,182, but the largest crowd to ever attend the game was in this year's All-Star Game of 46,700. To set Metropolitan Stadium for you, first, this game is authorized under television rights granted by the Commissioner of Baseball solely for the entertainment of our audience and any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited unless authorized in writing by the Commissioner. Let's take a look at Metropolitan Stadium now and check the dimensions. From home plate down the left field line, 344 feet. At the start of the year, it was 330, and they moved it back. The so-called power alley is 365 feet away, falling away to 402 feet, and the deepest part of the park straightaway center, 430. Then back again to 402, the power alley at 365 in right center, and 330 down the right field line. There is a 12-foot high wire fence around the ballpark, and in center field, it'll drop to about 10 feet, plus anywhere from 35 to a 40-foot black backdrop to furnish a hitting background for the batters. The starting pitchers during the course of the season would be along the baselines. However, in World Series time, they loosen up in the bullpen. There is Don Drysdale, loosening up for the Dodgers. Drysdale, a 23-game winner last year, has worked in three World Series games, and he has a victory mark of 2 and 0. Oh. Drysdale beat the Chicago White Sox 3-1 in 1959, and he beat the New York Yankees 1-0 last October, uh, October 5, 1963. Alongside the visiting bullpen is where the Minnesota Twins pitcher, Jim Grant, will be loosening up. Jimmy, a 21-game winner, making his first World Series appearance. He's the biggest winner in the American League this year, the first Negro pitcher ever to win 20 in a season in the American League. He equaled the Minnesota Club victory record this year, a mark originally set by Camilo Pasquale in 1963. Better known as Mudcat, his best previous year, 1961, when he won 15 games for Cleveland. He also led the American League in shutout with six. So Jim Grant and Don Drysdale in the first game of the series. Tomorrow will be a battle of left-handers. Jim Cott for the Twins, Sandy Koufax for the Dodgers. Talking about the Dodgers, let's go to their lineup right now. Leading off at shortstop, perhaps the most offensive-minded ball player in the ballpark today, the captain, shortstop Maury Wills. The veteran of the Dodgers, a reactivated coach, Jim Gilliam at third base. In center field, fleet-footed Willie Davis. In the cleanup spot, Ron Fairley in right field. Out of the minor leagues because of the broken leg suffered by Tommy Davis comes Lou Johnson to be in left field. The rookie in his first year, 22 years old, Jim Lefevre, a strong candidate for rookie of the year. 
In his second year in the big show, Wes Parker at first base, hitting seven. Johnny Roseboro will be behind the plate. And the pitcher, Don Drysdale. To illustrate the differences between the two clubs, the overall team batting average of the Twins, 254 to the Dodgers, 245, the Twins hit 150 home runs to the Dodgers, 78. And the Twins scored 774 runs to the Dodgers, 608. And then comes the other glaring difference between the two clubs in the stolen base department. The Twins, to do a good deal of running themselves, stole 90 bases this year. But the Dodgers stole 170, and it is one very strong reason why they are in Minnesota today. The wind that we have, and they tell us it will go anywhere from 18 to 25 miles an hour, is blowing from right to left. So it will favor drives headed for those double-deck stands and left, which are added to Metropolitan Stadium this year. Well, the first game of the 1965 World Series is being brought to you from Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota. They are calling the 1965 World Series the first transplant World Series in the sense that two franchises, formerly of other cities, finally get together in the World Series. Oh, certainly the Dodgers have been in them before, along with the Milwaukee Braves and the San Francisco Giants. But the Minnesota Twins are the first transplanted American League club ever to climb the pinnacle, thus setting the stage for this first transplant World Series. And the Minnesota Twins have been a tremendous story, not only leading the American League. And to tell us about that story and the Minnesota Twins, here's the voice of the Minnesota Twins, Ray Scott. Thank you, Vin Scully, and good afternoon, everybody. Let us look at the starting lineup for the Twins. At shortstop, and a leading candidate for most valuable player honors in the American League, Zoilo Versailles. Playing in left field and probably playing in left field when the Dodgers use a right-handed starting pitcher is Sandy Valdespino. The right fielder, and for the second year in a row, leading the American League in batting, Tony Oliva. Batting cleanup and very close to 100% form in his physical condition is third baseman Harmon Killebrew. Jimmy Hall will be in center field. The first baseman will be Don Mincher. Behind the plate, one of baseball's finest catchers, Batty. Earl Batty. At second Hello. base, a rookie, Frank okay. Quillacy. And on the mound, Jim Mutcat Grant, with a season's record of 21 wins and seven losses. Now, the umpires for today's game. At home plate, from the American League, Ed Hurley. At first base, from the National League, Tony Benson. At second base, the American League's John Flaherty. At third base, Ed Sudall of the National League. And as just about every baseball fan knows, in the World Series, two additional umpires are used. Working the right field line will be the National League's Ed Vargo and the left field line from the American League, Bob Stewart. As uh, Sam Mealy is at home plate, and Captain Mari Wills brings out the Dodger lineup. I think it might be uh, of interest to mention that Sam Mealy, who is facing us right now, is of course thinking about this baseball game. But I know too that his thoughts are on Quincy, Massachusetts, where Mrs. Mealy, Connie, is awaiting almost momentarily the arrival of the fifth child. There are no ground rules of any particular interest nothing beyond the ordinary that will apply here at Metropolitan Stadium. A fan can reach out and touch a ball here very, very seldom. A home run hit to a left field is in almost every instance a home run and it's there for you to see as such. The meeting at home plate has been concluded. In attendance today, Vice President Hubert Humphrey. He will toss out the first ball of this 1965 World Series. Tomorrow, by the way, the first ball will be thrown out by the governor of the state of Minnesota, Carl Rovog. So the Vice President with Mrs. Humphrey
Vice President Humphrey, of course, no stranger in these parts. He is, uh, among other accomplishments, a former mayor of the city of Minneapolis. The national anthem will be played by the Ralph Mendenhall Band. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Giving the starting lineup for the Minnesota Twins, I should have mentioned that in addition to Frank Willisey, left fielder Sandy Valdespino is also a rookie, although Sandy toiled long in the minor leagues before getting his major league opportunity. The vice president is poised. I must admit I know little of his uh, pitching prowess. I know he is a dyed-in-the-wool baseball fan. Governor Robog is just uh, behind the vice president, just over his left shoulder. I don't know whether he's picking out a favorite player or not. He was eyeing the field pretty well, deciding which way he was going to throw the ball. The announcement is being made by the public address announcer, Bob Casey. The announcement concerning the ceremonial throwing out of the first ball, and the crowd rises. Earl Batty is the recipient. The day before the Twins clinched the American League pennant, the vice president was with the Twins in the clubhouse. So we're just a moment away as we look at the Twins defensively. At first base is Don Mincher. At second base, Frank Quillacy, and alongside him, the shortstop, Zoilo Versailles. Carmen Killebrew is at third base. In left field, Sandy Valdespino. Fleet Jimmy Hall in center. Tony Oliva is the right fielder. Earl Batty is the Twins catcher. And on the mound, Jim Mudcat Grant. The twin, uh, rather the Dodger coaches at first base is Danny Ozark. And at third base is Preston Gomez. We pause briefly for station identification. Ed Hurley is conferring along with manager Sam Mealy as Mari Wills awaits uh, his turn at bat. He's already been announced as the leadoff batter, but manager Walter Alston of the Dodgers and manager Sam Mealy of the Twins and Ed Hurley, the home plate umpire, uh, have been conferring with the commissioner of baseball, Mr. Ford Frick. And of course, we can only guess as to the subject of their conversation. There's the commissioner. Jim Grant, the Twins pitcher, in his greatest season in the big leagues, a 21-game winner. 
He worked 270 and a third innings. His earned run average was 3.30. And to use an oft-used baseball phrase, he won the big games for the Twins. His record against first division opponents was outstanding. The Twins defensively against Wills have Hall shallow in center. Killebrew in on the grass at third. The shortstop, Versailles, however, three quarters of the way back. And here is the first pitch of the 65 series, and it's a called strike one. I asked Jim Grant uh, just what it's like in facing this fellow Wills just before the game. My thought on Mario Wills is that I know that uh, he is the best base field in baseball, but I can't elect, uh, let his running affect my thinking on the hitter. So I'll just forget him, keep him close, and I know if I keep him close, everybody can throw him out. Wills trying to bunt his way on. Foul and uh, a count of strike two. Then Scully, could I ask you, were there any of the National League clubs that used an unusual sort of a defense against Wills to protect the bunt? Ray, when Wills is batting left-handed in the National League against a fellow who throws pretty hard, the left fielder almost sits on the foul line. A two-strike count on Wills during the season, a 286 batting average. Foul into the Dodger dugout. The wind blowing strong, right to left. Strike three. Although Jim Grant is basically a fastball pitcher. He added to his pitching repertoire this year what has uh, come to be known not so much as a hard curve, but the Johnny Sane curve, because the Twins pitching coach, Sane, was mainly responsible in teaching the pitch to Grant. It has helped him a lot. Here is Junior Gilliam. Ball one inside. Junior, player, coach with the Dodgers, a 280 batting average. Batting here in the first inning with one out and none on, and the game just underway. Strike, one and one. Grant has excellent control. A foul tip, ball one, strike two. Grant in working 270 and a third innings walked only 61 while striking out 142. A count of ball one and strike two to Junior Gilliam. Right fielder Tony Oliva. Two away. As Willie Davis goes to the plate, I'm wondering if there has ever been a major league infield where every man was a switch hitter. Then Scully shakes his head no. Certainly I know no other major league infield as the Dodgers have now, and certainly this means a, an awful lot to the success of the team because you can stabilize that infield. Willie Davis, the center fielder, regular season batting average, 238. Ball one. and shade the outfield a bit to right for Davis. Tony Oliva. The Dodgers are out one for three. At the end of the first half inning, the score is the Dodgers nothing and the Twins coming to bat. defensively at first base Wes Parker at second base Jim Lefevre Mari Wills is the shortstop and Junior Gilliam is at third in the outfield and left Lou Johnson the center fielder is Willie Davis the right fielder is Ron Fairley the catcher is John Roseboro and on the mound 23 game winner Don Drysdale the twin coaches at first Jim Lemon and a third Billy Martin Leading off for the Twins, the shortstop, Zoilo Versailles. 
273 regular season batting average, led the American League in total bases. Versailles didn't get the big breaking ball. Dodger outfield almost straight away. Center fielder Willie Davis perhaps two steps toward left. Fastball outside, one and one. The Twins bat in the first inning. There is no score. Don Drysdale. Hard to put into words his value to the Dodgers. Curve low, ball two, strike one. Drysdale's earned run average after 308 regular season, season innings, a sparkling 2.78. Outside fastball, two and two. concession has been made to the World Series as far as seating is concerned some additional field boxes were added along the left field and right field lines. Gilliam has retreated a third with a 2 2 count of her size. Strike out. One away in the Maddie Twins' Stryker. first inning. And Number here is the left fielder, Sandy Valdespino. Sandy, a valuable member of the Twins this season, as manager Sam Mealy went to platooning at some positions. And Sandy has played mainly in left, although at times was used in right. Third baseman in tight. And Parker, the first baseman, is not too deep. Foul into the seats for strike one. And a broken bat. The month of September in the Twin Cities is a month that longtime residents would just as soon forget as far as the weather is concerned. But this, the first week of October, is what the longtime residenters will tell you is a typical October in this area. You just couldn't ask for a finer day. A strike to Valdespino. First inning, no score. Twins batting with one out and none on. Foul back. Two strike count. Twins would like to think that their ability to run is not measured alone by the stolen base, but rather by the taking of the extra base. All the way. Valdespino is fleet of foot. Sandy asks the plate umpire Ed Hurley examine the baseball. Big hop for the second baseman, the fever, and two down. We're asking Don Drysdale about his philosophy of pitching before the game today, and here's his idea. I just pitches with a fastball, curveball, and change, and sometimes I'll change off of my curveball. Uh, primarily in this series, where I'm going to try and keep the ball down, I am a low ball pitcher, and uh, from what we've heard, most of the Minnesota players are high ball hitters, so I've got to go just the opposite way and go to my strength. Tony Oliva is the Twins batter. 
He's the American League batting champion for the second year in a row. Last year won it as a rookie, and that's the first time a rookie ever won it. Foul back. Oliva, 321 regular season batting average. Last season, he won the title hitting 323. Most American League pitchers would tell you that Oliva has no known weakness. Although a pretty definite pattern has developed, they believe that they have their best uh, luck with him pitching him high and tight. A ball high, one and one. Oliva has been playing for quite a while with a bone chip in the middle finger of the right hand, and for a time it caused him to throw a bat many, many times, more than would usually be the case. Foul back, one and two. The last of the first inning and no score from Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota, the first game of the 1965 World Series. Dodgers play Oliva to hit to all fields. No shifting one way or the other. Wills, one, two, three inning for Drysdale. And so at the end of the first inning, the score is the Dodgers nothing and the Twins nothing. This 1965 World Series game is being brought to you live and in color exclusively on NBC. Well, the pitcher certainly dominated the first inning. We haven't had a base runner yet as the Dodgers come up in the second. It will be the right fielder, Ron Fairley, the left fielder, Lou Johnson, and the second baseman, Jim Lefevre. Fairley led the Dodgers and runs batted in with 70 while compiling a 274 batting average. Grant coming in high. The Twins play fairly slightly to the right. Ball two. Strike one. I believe the wind may be dying down just a bit. Three and one. had his look down at third base coach Preston Gomez. This one will be out of play along the left field line and a full count. To my knowledge, Ben, no one was clever enough to get into the ballpark and stay all night so that uh, although minus a ticket, they'd still see the series. If they did, they're not going to talk about it. Harmon Killebrew near the stands. But it's out of play. I checked with some of the men who did the searching, and they said that as far as they knew, uh, no culprits were found in the stands. I understand at the All-Star game, which was played here in this same ballpark at Metropolitan Stadium, one man tried to get in wearing an expensive suit but carrying 100 pounds of ice and said he was the ice man. <laughs> Full count to Ron Fairley. Deep. A home run, and the Dodgers take the lead by one to nothing as Ron Fairley lines the 3 2 fastball over the right field fence. So 
the Dodgers break through by using the long ball. Fairly homered nine times in the regular season. Here now is the left fielder, Lou Johnson. 259 regular season batting average. Foul back on the bunt attempt for strike one. Jim Grant gave up more home runs than any other twin pitcher. 34. One and one. Rather strike two. And I was checking the the Dodgers. And Drysdale led the Dodger staff in giving up homers, which uh, I guess in effect is a tribute to their great control. Two strike count on Lou Johnson. Fairley's homer is listed as traveling about 370 feet. High fastball, ball one, strike two. First World Series homer for Ron Fairley. Strikeout for Grant, his second. clinched the pennant. Rather, the day before they clinched the pennant, Grant came up with one of his finest efforts of the season, a one-hit performance over the Senators. The batter is Jim Lefevre. Taking ball one. And I guess, Ben, if you could point your finger at any one Dodger who was uh, really outstanding in the stretch run, it would be this young man right here. Sandy Valdespino in left. Waiting the fly ball. Two down. The Dodgers with a one nothing lead on Ron Fairley's line drive homer over the fence and right. Here's the right. Here is the first baseman, Wes Parker. broke through about oh I'd say two hours before the start of today's game and hiding every once in a while but right now it's in full sunshine blow ball two two and one of the permanent stands beyond the left field fence, the double deck stands, has, in the opinion of Twins players, cut down considerably on the number of home runs that have been hit to left field and will be hit. Full count as the fastball is inside. pitcher Don Drysdale. Well, we know Don's got a real good fastball that uh, moves in on you and also moves away at times and also has a fine slider. I think his motion uh, makes him most receptive and he's a real tough pitcher to face. wound up the season with 25 home runs and 75 runs batted in at a batting average of 269. Harmon missed almost seven weeks because of a, an elbow dislocation. 
breaking ball a bit high, ball one. Drysdale retired the Twins, one, two, three in the first inning, on a strikeout and two ground balls. Dodger outfield is shaded to the left. Breaking ball low, ball two. Killebrew will be followed by Jimmy Hall and Don Mincher. Strike two. Third baseman Junior Gilliam is pretty close to the line for Killebrew. Strikeout number two for Drysdale. With one away in the seven second inning, center fielder Jimmy Hall. It is manager Sam Mealy's intention to platoon in center field with Hall and the right-handed batting Joe Nasik in left field with Sandy Valdespino starting today against Drysdale. And when the Dodgers use a left-hander, he will go to Bob Allison. Barring a change in the manager's thinking, or something that would happen in the course of World Series play. Those will be the only two spots where they'll platoon. Curve over to Hall. Strike one. Hall knocked in 86 runs, homered 20 times, and had a 285 batting average. He is very fast. Strike two. Dodgers had their head of scouting Al Campanis following the twins for quite a while and it was his book that is guiding the Dodgers. Another strikeout for Drysdale. So three strikeouts now for a big right hander and with two out and none on in the second and the Dodgers leading one to nothing. Here is Don Mincher. The Twins first baseman hit 252 in the regular season. He is always a threat to hit the long ball. 22 homers, 65 runs batted in. Strike. Drysdale not giving him very much speed. Bit high, one and one. While taking batting practice today, Don came out of the cage and he said, well, just another game. And then he started shaking his hands and dropped his bat. He said, Scotty, this has just got to be the biggest day in a ball player's life. Play the home run. Deep to right. And the right fielder, Ron Fairley, knew it about the moment the ball left the bat. Drysdale's first pitch to catcher Earl Batty is fouled away for strike one. Batty, a 298 regular season batting average, six home runs, 60 runs batted in. Fielder Johnson. The Twins are up. And so at the end of the second inning, the score is the Dodgers one and the Twins one.
We would remind you that we'd like to have you with us again tomorrow, 2.45 Eastern Daylight Time, for the second game of this 1965 World Series, live and in color, exclusively on NBC. For the Dodgers in the third, with the score tied at 1-1, the catcher, John Roseboro, the pitcher, Don Drysdale, and the shortstop, Mari Wills. Roseboro, 238 regular season average. Fastball inside for ball one. And when the pitcher comes up for the Dodgers and his name is Drysdale, he's a hitter. Strike, one and one. Ron Fairley and Don Mincher with matching home runs and the score tied at 1-1. Strike two. Twin outfield just a bit to the right. Killebrew by the Dodger dugout. There is apparently still enough of the wind blowing that if the ball gets up near the top of the stands, it'll cause some trouble. I'll give you an indication as to the way the wind is blowing right now. It was listed as possibly gusting up as high as 25 miles an hour. Drysdale, 300 batting average, 19 runs batted in. 39 hits, including seven homers. A high curve, ball one. Foul out of play, one and one. some indication that he has been using the fastball to great advantage. And with two away, up for the second time in the game is Maury Wills. Grant got him on a called third strike in the first inning. Now the Twins are going to play the right side of the infield about halfway as Wills comes to the plate for the second time in the game. Versailles and Killebrew and Valdespino, and it's Versailles. inning at the end of two and one half the score, the Dodgers won and the Twins won. In the last of the third inning with the score tied at 1-1 in this first game of the 1965 World Series, the Twins will send up rookie second baseman Frank Pulisi, the pitcher Jim Grant, and the shortstop Zoil Oversize. Pulisi, with the Twins only the latter portion of the season after being recalled from Denver, knocked in just seven runs. But he knocked in the winning and insurance runs in the game that saw the Twins clinch a tie for the pennant. And he scored the winning run in a two to one victory in the pennant clinching game after doubling. Foul back, strike one. Fairly homered in the Dodger second, and Don Mincher homered in the last of the same inning, and so it's a 1-1 game. Foul away on the right side, strike two. The Dodgers figure that Quillacy will not pull Drysdale and have the center fielder well over toward right. Curve low, ball one, strike two. 
Drysdale has struck out three. Grant has struck out three. John Roseboro wants to huddle with Drysdale and uh, Billy Martin. Uh, certainly no stranger to World Series activity. The Twins third base coach has had a word with Jim Grant. The Dodgers already are setting up the infield in anticipation of a bunt. Shaded a little bit to the left. Outside, one and one. There is still quite a divot, and you might notice it there and out in front of the plate, taken by Drysdale as he tried to make the play on the sacrifice bunt by Jim Grant. Walter Alston 
heads to the mound. Hurried warm-up activity by Howie Reed in the Dodger bullpen. You know, Ben, try as I might, I have never yet from the uh, vantage point of a broadcast booth and ever to be able to say with anything of approaching authority well now that was a slider or that was a curve and it appeared to me that the pitch hit by Versailles definitely was up. Ray the one thing about Drysdale after watching him all these years although he has not walked the batter his control right now is very bad. He's doing exactly the opposite of what he wanted to do. There's Howie Reed in the Dodger bullpen. No outs. Three runs in. The Twins are leading four to one. Valdespino is on second. And the batter is Tony Oliva. Grounded out short to first in the first inning. As a sudden barrage. As Drysdale in trouble. Tight at third is Gillian. Outfield straight away. Foul strike one. season efforts resulted in shutouts. But the Twins have used the long ball plus one Dodger error to assume a four to one lead and still have a runner at second with no outs here in the third. Time called by the plate umpire Ed Hurley. Tony Oliva bats Jim Lemon is a very deep first base coach because of Tony's unfortunate habit of throwing the bat. Jim has had to duck on more than one occasion. A ball and two strikes. Third baseman Gilliam out at first and Valdespino holds at second one down. Number three, Is strikeout victim in the second inning. One of three twin batsmen struck out by Drysdale. The Dodger outfield will go deep and well around to the left.
through getting mainly a diet of breaking pitches. In addition to Howie Reed, the right-hander, the lefty is Jim Brewer in the Dodger bullpen beyond the right center field fence. Four to one is the score. The Twins are leading. One out. Valdespino is on second base. This is the last of the third. of course have seen Drysdale in spring training games. Killebrew among others uh, rates Drysdale's fastball as a truly great fastball when it's doing what Drysdale wants it to do. Base hit. Valdespino is held at third. Runners first and third. One away. Valdespino on third. Killebrew on first. The batter is Jimmy Hall, a strikeout victim in the second inning. Five hits off Drysdale in two and a third inning. the Dodger outfield. back at the stands but he'll have no play and a full count. Frank Quillacy led off the third inning for the Twins with a ground double between Gilliam and the third base bag. Grant sacrificed and when Drysdale's throw to first was juggled by Jim Lefevre an error resulted in the Twins at runners at first and third with no out. Versailles is homered to make it four to one. Valdespino double. Oliva grounded out with the runner holding at second, and then Killebrew's base hit to left moved Valdespino to third, and it's three and two to Hall. Safe at first. Valdespino, a conservative lead at third.
two down. Here's Mincher. Number five, John Mincher. First baseman Wes Parker will apparently not hold with Killebrew in this situation. Foul, strike one. One of the reasons these two teams are in the World Series is because they have made great use of such fundamental tactics as the, the hit and run and so forth and yet here we have five runs scored and all of them on the long ball the home run high one and one Drysdale has thrown many pitches here in the third inning Valdespino the twins runner at third Killebrew leading at first Two, two and one. Brewer is no longer throwing in the Dodger bullpen, but uh, Howie Reed, the right-hander, is still doing some tossing. is the eighth win to bat here in the third. will play batty as an opposite field hitter. Pickoff attempt takes perfect timing. Willie Davis, the Dodger center fielder, was moving toward the bag in the event of a, an off target throw. Strike one and one. Val Espino, who had doubled with no outs, is on second. Killebrew. Second base. He's single. Mincher walks as the runner at first. Foul back, one and two. Dodger batters do up in the fourth inning, the two, three, and four men in the order. Drysdale already has two World Series victories. He's never lost a decision in the series. In the shallow right. Base hit. One run in. Another run in. It is 
to one. A Texas League single just beyond the outstretched hands of second baseman Jim LaFever was too shallow for fairly the right fielder. Twins have batted around and up for the second time is Frank Willisie. His double started off the inning. And the Twins lead by six to one. Foul out of play, strike one. went to third on the hit. Batty is on first. Now that's the log on the new pitcher. Meanwhile, Drysdale will depart, having worked just two and two thirds innings. Off Drysdale, seven hits. He struck out four. And while the record will show that. The big Dodger right-hander walked only one man. The statistical record will not show that he was behind many hitters. So the Twins get to the Dodger starter here in the first game of the series and lead seven to one and still have runners at first and second with two out. The Twins pitcher Jim Grant will be the first batter to face Reed. <laughs> Drysdale leaves the mound. have had the label of these last few years of being a power team and did indeed last year in 1964 hit 221 home runs which was the second highest total for a team in Major League history. The Twins this year have not come up with the beginning on many occasions. Now they have as mentioned earlier had to scratch and scrounge for runs while not to the extent that the Dodgers have had. They still have uh, used the hit and run and so forth. But today it's been in the main the long ball. We watch Howie Reed warming up from our camera at ground level directly behind home plate here at Metropolitan Stadium. This Saturday NBC will telecast a major college football battle when Duke meets Pitt in the NCAA game of the week live and in color at 12.30 Eastern Daylight Time, 11.30 Central Time, exclusively on NBC. 
Remember that before every college football game is the Bud Wilkinson NCAA preview show. Jim Grant comes to the plate, was up earlier in this third inning, was called upon to sacrifice a runner to third and wound up a base runner himself. A tapper to the right side, Lefever, the first, the twins are out to score six runs. And so at the end of the third inning, the score is the twins seven and the Dodgers one. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBC Television Network. Commissioner Ford Frick is here today, of course, in this his final World Series in his official capacity as the Commissioner of Baseball. He is seated near the Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey, who tossed out the first ball today. Their boxes are located just to the home plate side of the Twins' dugout on the first base side. The Twins leading 7-1. to one. And here in the Dodger fourth inning, it will be the third baseman, Junior Gilliam, the center fielder, Willie Davis, and the right fielder, Ron Fairley. Grant has allowed one hit, the second inning homer by Ron Fairley. Gilliam flied out to right in the first inning. Strike one. ready when needed by the Dodgers this year. Fastball in close, ball two, strike one. The Twins are playing with Valdespino in left, Hall in center, and Oliva in right, and an infield of Killebrew, Versailles, Willisey, and Mincher. In the left center field, and a base hit. Jimmy Hall returns the ball to the infield, hit number two off Grant. Number three, Willie Davis. Here's Willie Davis. Sent Oliva to the fence in right center, where the Twins' right fielder made a leaping grab of his liner in the first inning. Grant has issued no walks. He has struck out three. Breaking ball over, one and one. Foul back off the curve, ball one, strike two. Dodger fourth inning, and here is Ron Fairley. Hit a 3 2 pitch over the right field fence in the second inning for his first World Series homer. In the regular season, Fairley homered nine times. Right. Fairley asks that the ball be examined. First baseman Mincher not holding with the runner with the Twins leading seven to one. Ball one, one and one. Four thousand 
standing room tickets were put on sale this morning. To the best of my knowledge, they were all disposed of in a short while. Outside, ball two, two and one. Fairly led the Dodgers in runs batted in with 70. Three and one. Oliva in right field. Two down. Number 41, Lou Johnson. The Dodger left fielder, Lou Johnson, is the batter. Struck out in the second. You know, Ben, I think of anybody, regardless of their line of work, thinks they're not getting anywhere after many years of uh, labor, could look to Lou Johnson for encouragement. To further illustrate the point, in 13 years, this is his 18th club. Ball one to Lou Johnson. Runner on first is Gilliam. Two out, Dodger fourth inning. Twins are leading seven to one. Ball two. send up the top of the order as American League President Joe Cronin looks on. Joe, uh, not only a member of baseball's Hall of Fame, former great player, manager, baseball executive. Zoyle Oversize, the twin shortstop, with a strikeout and a three-run homer to his credit. He'll be followed by Valdespino and Oliva. Howie Reed on the mound. Foul, the bunt attempt, strike one. Third base side foul, strike two. two-thirds innings. One down in the fourth and Valdespino rounded out second to first in the first inning and double to right in the middle of the Twins six-run rally in the third inning. Ball one.
weatherman has promised just about the same kind of weather for tomorrow, which uh, means just about perfect. Shallow right field, center fielder, Willie Davis. Two away. Number six. Here's Tony Oliva. In facing Drysdale, Oliva grounded out twice by way of the shortstop in the first and a third baseman in the third. The Twins have managed seven hits. Grant has limited the Dodgers to two, including Ron Fairley's home run in the second inning. For the Twins, there have been homers by Mincher with none on in the second, and Versailles with two on in the third. Foul. Oh. A comedy of errors becomes a comedy of terrors on I Spy at 10, 9 central time following Bob Hope Presents. Join secret agents Robert Culp and Bill Cosby on the prowl tonight. That's in color on NBC. A strike to Tony Oliva. Ball one. Two out and none on. This is the last of the fourth. Center fielder Willie Davis. One, two, three inning work by Howie Reed. So at the end of the fourth inning, the score is the Twins seven and the Dodgers one. To be a rookie in your first World Series. Jim Lefevre said this. After going through the National League pennant and the way it finished, about four or five teams at the last month had a chance for it, I'd say that uh, so far the, the pennant race has been a little bit more nerve-wracking than the start of the World Series. I can't say for sure right now about how I'm going to feel when the, as the games go, but uh, for the first game, I'm not much excited. I mean, not as much excited as I was about the, the pennant. The young Dodger second baseman takes the fastball high for ball one. Lefevre sent a fly ball to left in the second. Grant has allowed two hits. Fairley's homer in the second. Gilliam single leading off the fourth. Strike one and one. It is expected that today's attendance figure will be somewhere around 51,000. Just inside of the letters, two and two. When the White Sox had pulled within five games of the Twins the first week of September, it was Grant who beat the White Sox at Chicago three to two in a very big game. Full count here to Jim Lefevre. Six runs scored by the Twins in the third inning for the most runs scored in one inning against Los Angeles this year. During the season, five runs were scored against the Dodgers in one inning on four occasions. Ground ball to the second baseman, Quillacy, to Mincher, one away. The announcement has been made here in the press area, which uh, today is an enlarged press area because of the series, that the six runs scored in the third inning by the Twins represented the biggest inning against the Dodgers this season. In the regular season, five runs were scored against the Dodgers on four occasions. Wes Parker sending a fly ball to left. Sandy Valdespino, the left fielder there. Two down. With two away in the Dodger fifth inning, Number the runner will be the catcher, John Roseboro. John Roseboro. Fouled out to third baseman Harmon Killebrew in the third inning.
It is expected that tomorrow's second game will see a battle of left-handers. Sandy Koufax and Jim Cott. Strike one. Fastball high, 1-1. One, one. The American League umpire, as uh, I'm sure you've noticed, stands directly behind the catcher. Tomorrow, you'll see a National League umpire working the plate, and his position's a little bit different. Grant's curveball is low. Ball two, strike one. Two out, none on. Dodger fifth inning. Twins leading seven to one. Ball three. Grant has four strikeouts to his credit. Base hit to right. Hit number three. And Willie Crawford. Willie Crawford will bat for Howie Reed. So there'll be a new Dodger pitcher in the third of the day when the Twins bat in the fifth inning. Crawford in the regular season up just 27 times and had four hits. And the new Dodger pitcher will be left-hander Jim Brewer. Strike. Grant's fastball generally tails away from the left-handed batter. From the middle innings on, left field becomes somewhat of a problem when the sun is shining here at Metropolitan Stadium. Just below the knees, ball two, strike two. strikes in the first inning and popped up to the shortstop in the third. Four hits off Jim Grant and Earl Batty and Harmon Killebrew consulting with the Twins pitcher. Killebrew is the accepted Twins leader and always in a very quiet sort of a way. Foul will be out of play for strike one. Second with two out. One and one. The Dodger runners at second. 
Roseboro. Willie Crawford on first. Ball two. Jim Grant in two out, two on trouble. Long way to go, and Jimmy Hall there. And Grant is out of the inning as the Dodgers lead two men off. At the end of four and a half, the score is a good seven. And the Dodgers The second half of today's game is brought to you by Chrysler Corporation. into the last half of the fifth inning. It is my pleasure to bring in now the broadcaster of the Los Angeles Dodgers to carry you along the rest of the way, Vin Scully. Vin? Thank you, Ray, and hi, everybody. Left-hander Jim Brewer comes out of the Dodger bullpen, and it has certainly been a while for Brewer to see any action. In going back through the scorebook of the year, we have gone back into the season over three weeks and have not come up with his name. Brewer took a long time to come around to really be a major league pitcher. The last time he worked was September the 4th, so it's been a month. And the pitch that made him a major leaguer is now the pitch causing all the trouble, the screwball. When Brewer came up with the screwball, the Dodgers felt they had themselves quite a find. But in pitching the screwball, twice, Brewer has hurt his elbow and each time sidelined for a considerable time. He'll be pitching to Harmon Killebrew, Jimmy Hall, and Don Minchu. Seven runs, seven hits, and no errors for the Twins. They've left two. A run on four hits and an error for the Dodgers. They've left three. Harmon Killebrew struck out in singles. One for two. Breaking ball fouled away. The 1965 Dodger Ball Club has been compared somewhat to the 1959 Dodger Ball Club that was kind of a scrambler. And if so, they are carrying the comparison out to the umpteenth degree because the 1959 Ball Club lost the opening game to the Chicago White Sox 11 to nothing. One and one to Killebrew. Ball two. The outfield very deep and around the left on Killebrew. Breaking ball two and two. For the Dodgers, Don Drysdale, Howie Reed, and now Jim Brewer. Screw ball low, ball three, as the players call it, the Scroogey. Fastball on the corner and down he goes. The gym set him up, struck him out with the fastball. The well, Francis 1965 World Series game is being brought to you live and in color exclusively on NBC. Jimmy Hall. Round of applause for Jimmy Hall, who made the fine running catch on the drive by Maury Wills in the fifth inning. Jimmy struck out twice against Drysdale. Right. The one thing for Drysdale, you look up the Cole stats and you say he walked one, but he was way off in his control. Grant, on the other hand, appears to be following his game plan to perfection. One and one. Two, two and one.
breaking ball hit up along first base kicks foul the hall will come back inside again two and two for the Dodgers to look at the scoreboard and be down by six has to be discouraging their whole attack is based on the fact they stay close you take away the steal and the hit and run when you are as far back as they are however one of the biggest games they won in the closing weeks of the year they trailed six to one to the Braves one at seven six two and two to Jimmy Hall fastball hit to the hole off the glove of the feeder not out on the grass It'll be a base hit for Jimmy Hall. Base hit. Off Lefevre's glove, and here is Don Number Mincher. Five, Don Mincher. Mincher got the Twins even with his home run in the second inning, and then walked in the third. Eight hits for Minnesota. Well, one. Fly. Wills looks at Lefevre and Lefevre will handle it. And lets it drop on purpose to get Hall off the bases. So it goes a force play four to six to remove Jimmy Hall and Mincher aboard at first. And with two out, Earl Batty coming out. Number 10, Earl Batty. Force play four six. Field choice four six. So the Dodgers would much rather have Mincher aboard than Hall. And here's Batty, who is more or less a first ball hitter. Earl has flied to left and single to right. Takes a strike. Seven to one in favor of Minnesota. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning, two out. Don Mincher at first base. Screw ball. 0 oh and 2. Tranquility on deck. 0 oh 2 to Earl Batty. In the dirt to the backstop, Minshew to second base on the wild pitch. Wild pitch. Wild pitch. Minnesota seven, Dodgers one, bottom of the fifth, two out, one and two to Batty with Don Mincher at second base. The only Dodger run a home run by Ron Fairley. The Twins have had home runs by Don Mincher and Zolo Versailles. One and two. Curve hit off the fist to ground ball to the fever. Throws him out. No runs ahead, a man left, and at the end of five innings of play, Minnesota seven, the Dodgers one. League president Warren Giles of the National League is watching his 14th World Series as president of the league and is serving his 29th year as a National League executive. He took over as president in 1951 after serving in the front office of the Cincinnati Reds for 15 years. Here are the financial figures on today's first game. Jim Gilliam, Willie Davis, and Ron Fairley in that order. Right. Breaking ball just missed. One and one. Gilliam has flagged to right and single to center. One for two. The veteran on the Dodgers. He was the rookie of the year in 1953. 
Out of the way. One and two. They're talking about a lot of money in the background. The paid attendance, 47797 So they're talking about money over $350,000. Fastball, hit up the middle. Messias near the bag to nail him. $180,940. Willie Davis. One out deep to Tony Alivi in the first inning. The right fielder making a fine leaping catch. And last time up, struck out. The Dodgers Willie likes to get his swing. He's a first ball hitter if it's around the plate. He is one of the tougher men in the Dodger lineup to walk. $156.72 each club. The American League and National League share one and one. $3,156.73. Seven to one in favor of Minnesota. We're in the sixth inning in Jim Mudcat Grant. Going to work. Hit into left field and sinking for a base hit. $657. So Willie Davis gets the Dodgers' fifth hit. Ron Fairley. And with one out, Ron Fairley, the batter. Fairley homered in the second inning, flied to right in the fourth. And it was a difference of inches. He hit a high fastball for the home run and the pitch, a fastball a little lower, and he flied to right. Ron has had hand trouble since early August. Fly ball to left field. Valdespino going back a bit as the wind takes it. He's there. Two away. <laughs> Willie, of course, with the Dodgers trailing seven to one, one, figures to be a quiet base runner. Peter Lawford, Bethel Leslie, and special guest Roderick Crawford star in March from Camp Tyler when Bob Hope presents the Chrysler Theater tonight at nine, eight Central Time, in color here on NBC. Lou Johnson 0 for 2, make it 1 for 3. Willie goes to second and holds there. The Dodgers have to go 90 feet at a time, trailing by 6. So two on, two out, and Jim Lefevre the batter. Number 5, Jim Lefevre. Lefevre flied to left and grounded out to second base, 0 for 2. Fastball hit right at the shortstop for Sire. No runs, two hits, two left. And the score at the end of five and a half innings of play. Minnesota seven, the Dodgers one. I asked first year player Frank Quillacy uh, earlier today, just what have you been thinking about on the eve of your first World Series game? I've uh, just been thinking so darn much about the tickets and reservations that I've had to make since uh, the in-laws and the folks got down that I haven't really had much chance to think about the ball game. Drysdale gone today, I, I think it's better if you don't think about it. Just go up there and look for a baseball and try and hit the darn thing. Well, that's just what he did when he let off the third inning and pulled one inside third for a double, and that was the beginning of the end for Drysdale and the beginning of the sixth run inning for the Twins. Quillacy also singled. He went two for two in the third inning. Fouled a curveball down on his ankle. So Quillacy will have to walk it off. One of the tip-offs, I think, on Drysdale's trouble was the fact that Quillacy, who figured to see a lot of curveballs and does not figure to pull too much, was able to pull a Drysdale fastball inside third. Minnesota trainer coming up to have a look at him. That's George Lenz making sure that Frank is all right. One and one to Frank Quillacy. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning, seven to one Minnesota. Jim Brewer the third Dodger pitcher. 
Fastball fouled away. Curve miss. Two and two. In the Dodger bullpen, they're sharpening up somebody on whom they figure to rely on during the series, although not necessarily today, to get him a little work. Two and two. Fastball hit in the air to left field. Johnson is there. One away. Number 33. Jeff Grant. Here's Ron Paranofsky loosening up in the Dodger bullpen. The Dodger bullpen did not see too much work during the close of the season. In winning 15 out of 16, the Dodgers staff had eight shutouts. Here's Jim Grant, and he got a well-deserved round of applause. Ball one. Ray, have you seen Jim look much better than he has today? Oh, perhaps uh, in certain respects, but I honestly think uh, Jim is very much like a pitcher who pitches just as well as he thinks he has to pitch to win. In other words, with a lead, he concentrates on throwing strikes. That's his basic philosophy. And so far, since the Twins got out in front, he's allowed five hits, but they came with two outs and no run. One and two. The Dodgers had one hit in the top of the fourth, then two singles in the fifth, two singles in the sixth, but no runs. They have only the run by Fairley's home run in the second. One and two. Hit inside third and down the line. He hung a curveball, and Lou Johnson chasing it in the corner slips and falls down, but recovers, and Grant has himself a stand-up double. Second hit off Brewer, the ninth hit for the Twins. The Twins with nine hits have two home runs and three doubles. We'll calmly accept this one. Here is Zoila Versailles. Struck out twice, but in between, did a three run home run in the third. This figures to be Brewer's last inning of work. He's due to bat third when the Dodgers hit in the seventh. One out, Grant at second base, seven to one, Minnesota. Versailles is a first ball hitter. At least he has the reputation. Jim Brewer, many years ago, about nine to be exact, was seriously injured in a fight with a ball player who is now coaching at third base for the Minnesota Twins, Billy Martin. Line drive into center, base hit. Grant to third, and they're waving him in. And the throw will go into second base. Eight to one, Minnesota. And well over Sias stands at first base with five runs batted in. He's got reason to smile. Sandy is one for three. Leading eight to one, and he works a piece of gun to death. Whoa. Brewer, 
figuring the twins now might want to practice a little hit and run. The crowd wants the science to steal. 8 1 Minnesota. And the crowd can't even go. Almost had him leaning the wrong way, but the throw came on the wrong side of the bag. Brewer has oh, an average move to first. There you go. The pitch out. Roseboro. High to receiver. He's in there. Let's take a look at that again. NBC instant replay. There he goes. The throw is high. And he's under the tag. On a pitch out, one ball and no strikes to Valdesino. In there, one and one. Eight runs, ten hits, and no errors. One run, six hits, and one error for the Dodgers. Brewers still worried about Versailles out there at second base. Pulled to Parker. He goes to the bag. Versailles goes to third. That brings up Tony Oliva with Versailles at third and two out. A run over in the sixth. And the Twins leading eight to one. Oliva grounded to short, grounded to third, glide to center. Made a fine defensive play in the first inning on a drive by Willie Davis. Owen one to Oliva. Oliva is not a wrist hitter. He more of a sweep type, so that he hits a lot to the opposite field. Grounded foul outside a third, and a pretty good example of it. You have a hitter who swings such as Tony Oliva, you try to jam him. 0 oh 2. Well over Tyus at third base. Chased the curve, fouled it away, lost his bat. As Ray mentioned earlier, Tony has had a hand trouble and consequently still has a problem holding on to that bat. One Minnesota, two out, bottom of the six. Doyle Versailles at third base. Dodgers have used Drysdale, Reed, and Brewer. Seven of the eight runs charged to Drysdale. Blowing away. One and two.
popped into left field and fading on it is Johnson. That'll do it. So they get a run on two hits and leave a man. And at the end of the sixth inning, the score, Minnesota eight, the Dodgers one. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBC Television Network. Commissioner Ford Frank, enjoying the 62nd World Series. In the previous 61, the American League won 37 and the National League 24. Friends, throughout the football season, NBC will bring you the top college football games of the year, highlighted by such classics as USC Notre Dame, Texas Arkansas, Nebraska Oklahoma, and Army Navy. And then at the end of the year, NBC brings you the most and the best of the postseason bowl games featuring the East-West Shrine Game and the Senior Bowl, and topped by that New Year's Day triple header, the Sugar Bowl, the Rose Bowl, and the Orange Bowl, all in color and exclusively on NBC. Ball one to Wes Parker. Wes likes to bunt. Want to know the count. He has struck out and flied to left, over two. One and one to count. West Parker, Johnny Roseborough, and we'll see about a hitter for Brewer in the seventh. Ball two. Grant with a good fastball and moving the pitches in and out. Away. Ball three. Grant has not walked a batter. He has struck out four. Minnesota, seventh inning. High and away. Ball four, and here's number one, issued by Grant. Number eight, John Roseboro. Parker at first base, and Johnny Roseboro checks in, fouled out to third, and single to right. Lasias to the mound to talk to Grant. Roseboro, basically a low ball hitter. But he's had trouble pulling. As John said, his bat has gotten lazy. Right. Dodgers have Wally Moon out on deck to bat for Jim Brewer. Missed one ball, one strike. Parker at first, they're not going to hold him, leading 8-1 in the seventh. Curveball, good one. When Grant changes up, he changes off the curveball, but we haven't seen him throw one change off the fastball yet. Fastball fouled away. Fly ball to right field. Oliva back and over to his right. One away. The Dodger bullpen, Ron Taranowski, has stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, for the North Angeles Dodgers, Bob Miller and left hander Johnny Padres are up. And Number here's nine, the announcement on Wally Moon. Moon. Miller, the right hander, Padres, the left hander, of course. And the Twins have a left hander, Jim Merritt, loosening up in their bullpen. to Wally. There's Jim Merritt, who worked in the Dodger Clubhouse in 1961 with another kid by the name of Jim Lefevre. 
They both played on the Dodger Rookie Club in 61, and now they're in the big one. Top fly, back to third, Killebrew and Versailles, and Killebrew. Two out. Number 30, Maury Wells. Will struck out, fouled out, and with two on and two out on the fifth, hit a line drive into left center, and Jimmy Hall made a fine running catch. So Maury is 0 for 3. On the hand, 4-1. For right Before the game, Jim Grant said that the way he was going to prevent Wills from stealing all those bases was to keep him off the bases, and he's done it. So far, base hit to right. Parker goes to 90 feet. The run is at first and second with two out, and Jim Gilliam the batter. Jim Merritt, the left hander, up for the twins. Number 19. Seven hits off Grant. Jim Gilliam. And the batter is Jim Gilliam. Jim is in his sixth World Series. 1953, his first one. Today, he's one for three. Wills at first will be quiet now, but when he talks about base running, here's what he has to say. I feel that a, a, a base runner or a base dealer um, such as myself um, has to run uh, constantly, just as a pitcher has to pitch every four well, days in order to maintain his rhythm and timing, and a hitter having to play um, every game in order to uh, keep his rhythm and timing at the plate. I have to, as a base runner, a base dealer, uh, run often in order to keep my timing on the bases. Uh, my rhythm as far as getting the jump and being quick, deciding when the pitcher is going uh, to pick me off and when he's going home. So uh, uh, because of this reason, a lot of times I steal a base uh, when maybe we're four or five uh, runs ahead in the latter part of the game, and sometimes maybe uh, two, three, or four runs behind early in the ball game. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm criticized for this, but that's only because uh, uh, people don't realize why I'm running or my reason for running. So says the captain, two and two to Gilliam with two out in the seventh, eight to one Minnesota. Parker at second, Wills at first. Willie Davis on deck. High fly ball to right field. The lead is there. That'll do it. No runs to hit. Two men left in the score. At the end of six and a half innings of play, Minnesota eight to Dodgers one. Big crowd of 47,797, a new Metropolitan Stadium record. And coming in out of the Dodger bullpen is Ron Paranowski. Ron Paranowski. This might come as some surprise to people to say, how in the world would you bring in your ace when you are trailing eight to one? However, the Dodgers starters were so strong and so effective in the last two weeks of the pennant race that the bullpen suffered from inactivity and Paranowski thrives on work and so Walter Alston decided to better get him in a little work here so he is the fourth Dodger pitcher Drysdale Reed and Brewer have preceded him Paranowski was in 59 games during the year an ERA of two one and loss record of six and six and has been almost overpowering since number three August. I'm in syllabus. This 1965 World Series game is being brought to you live and in color exclusively on NBC. Harmon has struck out twice and singles. Paranowski throws curveballs and sinkers. Curveball, ball one. In the language of pitchers, Paranowski drags his arm. He gives you a lot of body motion, and then the arm comes around. Sinker was right. One and one. Eight to one, Minnesota. Bottom of the seventh inning. In the dirt, ball two. Johnny Roseboro says that he can catch Drysdale and Kofax 
without feeling half the shock and the pain of catching a Paranaski sinker. Serve in the dirt, ball three. He hadn't worked in about nine days, and he can use it. Three and one. Three and one to Harmon Killebrew. 47 and two-thirds innings. Just two Fouled away. The Minnesota bullpen also wants to get their relief men sharp. And so the number one right-hander, Alan Worthington, loosening up. There's Big Red. Three and two. Low curve high. So Killebrew walks to open the seventh. And that'll bring up Jimmy Hall. Number seven, Jimmy Hall. Jimmy Hall struck out twice, singled off Lefevre's glove, and made a fine defensive play. Don Mincher. Paul checking to see if perhaps the butt is on. Checking Billy Martin. Jimmy drags well. Rolls one up along first. Parker letting it roll. Foul. So Hall will try it again and kill a brew back to first. One ball and one strike to Jim. Eight runs, ten hits for the Twins. One run, seven hits, and an error for the Dodgers. Bottom of the seventh. Curve is in there. One and two. Gilliam is back in a normal depth of third now that they have two strikes on Hall. Each side scored a run in the, first, in the second inning, and then the Twins pour it apart with six in the third. Sinker missed. Minnesota added another in the sixth inning, and they lead eight to one. Killebrew at first. Nobody out. Breeze is picked up again, blowing from right to left. Sinker missed. Three and two. Now we'll see if the Twins play run and hit with a full count. Run and hit, of course, with a three-ball count on the batter. He's not obligated to chase ball four. Different from hit and run. Do not go, and the runner, ball four. So the Twins with runners at first and second, and a rusty Karnowski has walked two, and now faces Don Mincher. Don Mincher. Mincher homered in the second inning, walked and scored a run in the third, hit into a force play in the fifth. So Don is one for two. The Dodgers think that Mincher will bunt. Both Parker and Gilliam are up. He's around to bunt. 
takes the curve for a strike. A throw down to Will, not in time. Killebrew back. Killebrew at second, Hall at first, and Mincher checking again with Billy Martin. One and one. Minches checking Billy Martin. He fouled it away, trying to bunt one and two. Seventh inning, eight to one, Minnesota. Armin Killebrew at second, Jimmy Hall at first, nobody out. One and two, the count to Don Mincher with Earl Batty on deck. Curveball, hit into right center, fairly on the move. One hands it on the dead run, and the runners have to scamper back. Nice play by Ron Fairley. The only thing that made that play possible was Fairley had a good jump. Number 10, Earl Batty. Earl Batty, fly to left, looped the single to right and ground it out. One for three. He's another fellow with a rep of being a first ball hitter, and the Twins like to play hit and run with him. Fouled it back. On one. Armin Killebrew at second, Jimmy Hall at first, one out. 8-1 Minnesota, bottom of the seventh. Ron Paranowski, the fourth Dodger pitcher. Sinker missed, one and one. Friends, Dean Martin welcomes this all-star cast tomorrow night at 10, 9 central time. Vic Dumone, Alan Sherman, Gordon and Sheila McRae, Shani Wallace, and Ferranti and Teicher. The Dean Martin Show tomorrow night in color on NBC. One and one. Sinker hit back to Paranowski. He goes high to Wills. He got him and goes to first on a bounce for a weird double play. <laughs> One, six, three. No runs, no hits, a man left. And at the end of seven, the score, Minnesota eight, and the Dodgers won. The Dodgers are not going to show that last double play in spring training to the rookies, but we'll show you how to do it the hard way. He goes high to Will. Kicks the bag on a bounce to Parker for the double play. Beautiful. Here's Willie Davis. Then Ron Fairley and Lou Johnson. Eight to one, Minnesota in the eighth. Killebrew on the grass. Line to right, Oliva puts it away. One out. Ron Fairley did a home run in the second inning, slide to right and slide to left, and made the nice running catch on the drive by Minshew. Number six, Ron Fairley. drive into right center. Oliva going back on the ball, away back to the wire, and makes the catch. So Fairley goes out about 375. 
Let's look at that again and watch how the wind pulls it away. I drive into right. Looks like he's there and then quickly over. Lou Johnson, ball one. Lou is struck out, popped up, and single to left. One for three. Fisted on a little looper to second base. He was jammed and they're out in order. And the score at the end of seven and a half innings of play, Minnesota eight, the Dodgers one. Bottom of the eighth inning, eight to one, Minnesota. Frank Quillacy, pitcher Jim Grant, and Zoilo Vasias coming up in that order. Number 11, Frank Quillacy. Quillacy double singled and flied to left. His double was the opening shot in the third round when Minnesota scored six times and broke the game wide open. Field. Johnson over to his left makes the catch. One away. Number 33, Jim Grant. An ovation building up and well deserved for Jim Grant. So watch Johnson make that running catch. Jim has one hit today, a double. He also sacrificed in the third inning, trying to bunt Quillacy over to third. Drysdale fell down and then threw on a bounce to Lefevre, who juggled. Everybody was safe, and then it started. Fly ball down the line, slicing away from Fairley, but he's there. Fair ball if you're scoring. Two out. Zola over Sias. At the big home run in the third inning with Quillacy and Grant aboard. Singled in the sixth, stole a base. He's two for four. Ray, it seems quite a surprise to see a fellow like Versailles and realize how he led the league in total bases and all his power. He's deceptive. He's uh, very strong. And of course, uh, in the leadoff spot to knock in 77 runs, uh, those with the twins, twins felt that was an outstanding achievement as well. He has uh, deceptive power. In the leadoff spot, he drove in 77. The Dodgers' top man was Fairley. He drove in 70 in the cleanup role. Curveball hit foul. And tied the World Series record for most put-offs in a nine-inning game by a right fielder. The record was originally set by John Murray of the New York Giants in 1912 and tied by Ed Miller of one and two. A's in 1930 by Ray Blade of the St. Louis Cardinals in 1930. Playing against each other on the same day, October 5th, Miller and Blade each had seven put ups for the respective one and two. right field. All two. If you're not keeping score, when the Dodgers come up in the ninth inning, they are due to send up Jim Lefevre, Wes Parker, and Johnny Roseboro. Ball three. Aronofsky pitching his second inning in relief. Fouled away. Minnesota eight, Los Angeles one here in the bottom of the eighth. 
Big Hopper to third foul. So they'll try it again. Gilliam foul again, almost a duplicate of the last ground ball. Sinker fouled off to the right out of play. Tomorrow afternoon, it'll be left-hander Jim Cott for the Minnesota Twins and left-hander Sandy Kopax for the Dodgers. This Sunday, NBC will telecast one of the top American Football League games of the year when the San Diego Chargers meet the Buffalo Bills at Buffalo. This Sunday, the Buffalo Bills, the San Diego Chargers. Line drive at will. That'll do it. They're out in order in the eighth. And so at the end of the eighth inning, the score, Minnesota eight, the Dodgers won. Ninth inning. 8-1 Minnesota, the Dodgers with Jimmy LaFever, Wes Parker, and Johnny Roseboro. LaFever flied to left, grounded to second, lined out to short, 0 for 3. Line base hit to left field. Eight hits for the Dodgers, but the only run Came on a leadoff home run by Ron Fairley in the second inning. Number 28, Wes Parker. Wes Parker struck Number out, flied to left and walked. High today was the feet of the Twins' Frank Cloakley in getting two wicked hits in the second inning today. Five fouls, slicing off third and out of play. The last man to do it was Bob Sir of the New York Yankees on October 8th, 1960. First inning. Two hits in an inning for Pulisic tied the record held by 12 players previously. Breaking ball over. Good curve. 0 2. Ground ball up the middle. Base hit. Lefever goes to second and decides to keep going. He's the first Dodger in the last four innings to take an extra base. The runners at first and third, nobody out, and Johnny Roseboro, the batter. Parker with an 0 2 curveball up the middle. Johnny Roseboro has fouled out, singled, and flied out for the Dodgers with nine hits. Everyone in the starting lineup has one of them. Except the pitcher, but his pinch hitter picked up one, Willie Crawford. Fastball, pop foul off third. Killebrew coming over to the boxes. He's got it. One out. Hey, coming out of the doggy oh, dugout, Don LeJohn. He wears his age on his uniform. He's 31 years old. In the Dodger organization for 10 and a half years. And at Albuquerque was a player coach. And was eventually called up and did a fine job. So Don LeJohn, after waiting 10 and a half years in the minors, gets into a World Series. Two on, one out. Eight one, Minnesota in the ninth. Grant trying to lock it up. The 
The Dodgers have used both left-hand pinch hitters, Wally Moon and Willie Crawford. So now they have to dip into the right-handers. Fastball, first right. Grant now has been hit on the curve in this inning. So he probably go back to that fastball. Boom, he really ripped another one. I'll say he's going to the fastball. Oh, and two. So Jim Grant, who has four strikeouts and stopped striking out people back in the fourth inning, now trying to close up shop. Oh, and two. Breaking ball got him playing. So two fastballs and a curve disposes of LeJohn. Two out, and the Mudcat is one out away. Moy Will struck out, fouled out, lined out to Hall in left center, and single to right. One for four. The bunt foul. Wes Parker back to first. Jimmy LeFever holding a third. Will's trying to pick somebody up. Fastball butted up along first. Mudcat picks it up, throws on a bounce, too late. The bases are first and second, and the run is over. The Wills out legs that bunt up along first base. And it makes it eight to two. So a bunt single for Will. Parker to second, Lefebvre scores. So the Dodgers now with two runs on 10 hits. The Twins have eight runs on 10 hits. Fastball is hit into left center. Valdespino racing over and makes the catch for the out. In the ninth inning for the Dodgers, they get one run on three hits and leave two. And the final score at Metropolitan Stadium, the Minnesota Twins eight and the Dodgers two. For Minnesota, eight runs, ten hits, and no errors. For the Dodgers, two runs, ten hits, and one error. In a moment, we'll review the highlights of the game for you. 47,797 Minnesotans filing out of Metropolitan Stadium as the Minnesota Twins win their first game of the 1965 World Series, 8-2. To give you the official stats and the highlights of the ball game and close-up shop for the day, let's hop back over to Ray Scott. Thank you, Vince Scully. The line score for the Twins winning this first game of the 1965 World Series. For Minnesota, eight runs, ten hits, no errors, and five men left on base. For the Los Angeles Dodgers, two runs, ten hits, one error, and nine men left on base. Jim Mutcat Grant, a 21-game winner in the regular season, goes the distance to notch the World Series opening win for the Twins. For the Dodgers, Don Drysdale took the loss as he worked two and two-thirds innings. And although he gave up seven runs, only three were earned. Drysdale was followed by Howie Reed, Reed working one and a third innings and allowing no runs or hits. Jim Brewer went two innings, allowed three hits and one run, and Ron Peronoski worked the final two innings, giving up no hits or runs. And as Vin Scully mentioned, although the Twins were leading eight to one, and the question might naturally rise as to why Peronoski was used in that situation, he needed the work. There were home runs for the Dodgers by Ron Fairley, for the Twins by Zoilo Versailles, his with two on, Fairley's was with the bases empty, and Don Mincher homered with none on for the Twins as well. Versailles knocked in a total of four runs for the Twins. This game is authorized under television rights granted by the Commissioner of Baseball solely for the entertainment of our audience, and any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game 
without the express written consent of the commissioner is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited unless authorized in writing by the commissioner. The weatherman has promised ideal weather again for tomorrow's game, which means that the sun should be shining here in Bloomington, Minnesota at Metropolitan Stadium, and the temperature should be around 70 degrees. Tune in tomorrow at 2.45 Eastern Daylight Time for the second game of this 1965 World Series when your host, as today, again will be Chrysler Corporation, famous for quality engineering. Today's host, Plymouth, and Gillette, the people who know men best. Peter Lawford, Bethel Leslie, and special guest Roderick Crawford star in March from Camp Tyler when Bob Hope presents the Chrysler Theater tonight at 9, 8 central time, in color here on NBC. This is the CBC Television Network.